Thank you so much, Felix, um, for, and, and thank you, uh, Andrea. Uh, thank you, Tudor. Thank you, all the other people involved in the organization of this. I'm honored to have been invited and, and, uh, and uh, 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 much looking forward to the conversation later on today as well. Um, uh, and of course, I need, to, I need to mention, as we all need to be thinking about the, the fact that this is all happening in the midst of a sad and tragic moment, not only for European history, but for global history. I, you know, it, in, in a way, it, it, it serves as one of the most dramatic reminders we could, we, could, we, could, uh, uh, we could think of, of how very fortunate we all are <laughs> to, to even be able to devote a little bit of our time to, to, uh, to these fantastically interesting, humane and human issues that we, that we care so much about. Um, but boy, what a backdrop. Um, all right, um, let me first of all share my screen. Uh huh. And why has there it is? Okay. Are we good, Felix? Yes. Good. Excellent. Um, okay. Um, so I want to start today with a parable about the origin of music. Long ago, some lineage of our ancestors began vocalizing in ways unlike the nascent proto language they also practiced. They began to produce proto song. Proto song tended to organize itself in periodic rhythmic cycles, while proto language did not, at least not as clearly. And proto song, unlike proto language, was regularly linked to other periodized bodily actions. We can call them proto dance. Proto song also featured a sustained vocalization hovering on or around certain frequencies, unlike proto language, which tended to slide through frequencies in its intonational shapes without featuring any of them. Moreover, the frequencies joined in an active proto song tended to be related to one another in simple integer ratios, two to one, three to two, so forth. Something in the social lives of these early humans was changed in the presence of proto song, something that granted them as a group some survival advantage. We can name possibilities as to what this something was following hypotheses that, that have been advanced and elaborated more than once. Perhaps proto song served as a courtship display, facilitating mate attraction from neighboring groups. This is, of course, is Darwin's sexual selection hypothesis, still implausibly alive and well today. Perhaps proto song helped mothers to calm their infants, enabling the mothers to engage more effectively in other activities such as foraging or the group as a whole to avoid attracting predators. This is the lullaby hypothesis or the infant directed song hypothesis as we might call it. Perhaps proto song facilitated coalition making within the group, especially in its rhythmic periodicity, thus easing communal labor or aiding in territorial defense. This is the much traveled social bonding hypothesis. Related to the social bonding hypothesis is the ritual hypothesis in which proto song in its difference from proto language helped to mark off social spaces for the special repeatable behaviors, that is to say rituals that were increasingly important for the group's solidarity. Bordering on this ritual hypothesis is another one, Stephen Mython's leftover hypothesis in which as proto-language was increasingly co-opted for use in propositional structures aimed at the real world and actions in it, proto-song served instead to put humans in touch with the spirits and invisible realms they celebrated in those special ritual spaces. One more hypothesis finally is Ian Cross's idea of floating intentionality in which proto songs indeterminacy of meaning made it valuable in all social situations of uncertainty or ambiguity, fraught situations that it helped to disarm. This is related by the way to social bonding and it's also related to, uh, to the honest or credible signaling uh, hypothesis, both of which we heard about from Patrick Savage earlier today. Now for me, the last few hypotheses, the ritual leftover and floating intentionality hypotheses are particularly suggestive. First, because they help to identify music's connection to ritual in which, hum in which every human society, uh, which in every human society seems to be an important one. And second, because they focus our attention on what I regard as a foremost challenge today facing musical studies of all sorts, whether scientific or culturalist. 
that is understanding the differences between natural human language and natural human music. To achieve this aim, I think we need to incorporate in our thinking the divergent semiotic operations that predominate in language and music, symbolic in language and indexical in music. I've used this neo-Persian semiotics in several writings now to understand the coming to modernity of the hominin tribe, not only in music, but more generally. And I'll come back to this point a little bit at, at the end. But these hypotheses, suggestive though they may be about music's functions in human societies, fail if their basic intent is to explain the origin of music. And so do all the other hypotheses on the slide. Each of them might well point to important functions of music in early human societies, functions that remain important today indeed. I'm thinking of the wonderful demonstration we had of the, of, 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 uh, of the lullaby hypothesis by Patrick this morning, one of, the, one of the most charming videos I've seen in any conference I've been at. Um, but in any case, even though they may point to important functions of music in, in human societies, even though those functions may persist today, the hypotheses are powerless to speak of the biocultural emergence of music. Whichever hypothesis is favored, it leads to a causal narrative that makes nonsense of evolutionary process. Whichever hypothesis is favored, the conclusion drawn is always the same. This is why music was selected for among ancient humans. Because of music, they bonded better, they calmed their infants better, they had more sex, they communicated with spirits better. Whatever it did, this was the advantage music conferred. This was what made music a target of selection. This was what marked music as an adaptation, increasing the fitness of humans. But think for a moment what a misleading thing any such story is. In the first place, what is this monolithic music targeted by selection? We know that music is no singular phenomenon, but involves an array of capacities generated by complex cognitive processes. And though we understand these processes only partially, it's clear that they include things like these. The processing of periodic rhythmic cycles that I mentioned before, enabling among other, among other things entrainment to a beat. The amazing processing of certain oral stimuli with simple overtone structures to yield the percept of pitch. The related processing of those same stimuli in the presence of varying balances of overtones, varying onset and decay and other features to yield our immense sensitivity to timbre and our tendency to relate different pitches in clusters whose fundamentals are related in simple integers reflected most basically in the percept of octave equivalence. And these are only some of the capacities most specialized for music, more general capacities underlying music and much else include complex auditory stream analysis, separating distinct oral streams by pace, amplitude, directionality, and more, and the processing of stimuli into layered hierarchies. Now, each of these cognitive capacities, increasing evidence suggests, is not widespread beyond Homo sapiens today. All these capacities together sponsor a phenomenon, that is music, that is probably unique to us. The capacities seem to develop as universally in humans as capacities for language do, and without the need for anything more than normal rearing and socialization. We are all natural musicians, just as we are all natural linguists. Cognitively, the capacities may rely on neurons firing in coordinated simple inter integer ratios from which in emergent neural networks, musical percepts somehow take shape. Exactly how this happens is certainly beyond my expertise, but the exact process doesn't need to be known in order to make my point. Now consider again the evolutionary scenarios proposed by the hypotheses I reviewed before. They start from a full-fledged proto-music as I did in describing them. They must start here in order for proto-music to be a target of selection. Only something like a full-fledged music could fulfill the hypothesized social functions that would confer advantage on it. But how did our ancestors arrive at proto-music at the coalesced array of cognitive capacities I've just listed? How, when one of these capacities began to fall into place in some lineage of hominins, but long before anything like music or proto-song or proto-dance could have existed, how did natural selection see the capacity's musical future, so to speak? Even if this capacity conferred some selective advantage, the advantage could not as yet have had anything to do with music. All the hypotheses I reviewed presuppose the existence of the thing whose origin they set out to explain. 
they run in circles, unable to touch the question of the origin of music. Now we can call this problem the granularity problem. Music comprises too large a clump of cognitive and bodily capacities to be an incipient target of selection. It must have emerged from simpler, more fine-grained traits. Of course, the granularity problem extends far beyond questions of music's evolution and far beyond humans to complicate evolutionary narratives of all complex traits fulfilling complex functions. I'll come back to this point. To counter-argue that evolution often moves in leaps and occasionally in major transitions, both are true, is no counter-argument at all for the case of music because of the kind of coalescence that would need to have happened in order for a leap to music to occur. That is, a coalescence all at once in a particular lineage of the cognitive and bodily processes that sponsor music. The likelihood of such an event is vanishingly small, just as the likelihood that a magic bullet language gene brought about modern human language, advocated still by some post-Chomskyans, is vanishingly small. Instead, we need a fine-grained narrative involving many moving parts and many stages. The need for an exacting incremental account is why in my 2015 book that's already been mentioned on music's emergence, I began my narrative a million years ago, long before music could have existed, with an in-depth look at Acheulean stone technologies, how they happened, how they were transmitted across many thousands of generations. From these, it seemed to me, we might glean some hints about a taskscape in which rhythmic periodicity came to be prominent and valuable, especially in pedagogy. Then I described a lower paleolithic taskscape 500,000 years ago, a voicecape in which vocal indexicality, vocalized indication or pointing, became more and more focused and versatile without as yet any sign of linguistic symbolism. From there, I'm, <clears throat> I, uh, I moved on to the hierarchizing digital cognitive capacities apparent in Neanderthals, revealed in their complex stone napping sequences. For instance, here, the level wah point making sequence, their composite, stone tool their composite tool technologies and elsewhere in their life ways. And finally, I moved to early homo sapiens and the piecing together of these things dependent on feedback networks involving cultural systems of growing intricacy. My narrative in a million years of music was certainly not granular enough, as I will point out here, but it was a start. Let's shift course, turning for now away from music and approach the granularity problem from the vantage of niche construction. This phrase names a fundamental aspect of evolutionary process, already glimpsed by Darwin, but not much theorized until the last 20 years or so, when it became one of the main planks in the so-called extended evolutionary synthesis. I'll suggest that it's still not fully theorized even today. Niche construction theory proposes a dynamic of mutual alteration between organisms and their environments. It follows the ways organisms create niches by exploiting some resources in their surroundings, but not others, making them into affordances, to use James Gibson's productive term. Because populations of organisms construct affordances in this way, they change the balances of the limited resources available in their surroundings. Across generations, this results in altered ecological inheritances that their descendants will encounter. And this means that the organisms themselves are involved in changing the selective terrains of their lineage and of other organisms co-evolving with them. This is the crucial les lesson of niche construction theory. Phenotypic change and selection of genetic processes underlying it run through the changing environments brought about by the phenotypes themselves. Organisms and their environments are linked across time in an evolutionary feedback cycle of mutual change. But across how much time? Can we place a lower limit on the time scale for niche construction? How fine in temporal terms is evolutionary granularity? Niche construction theorists have tended to advance coarse-grained models and examples, cases of large-scale ecological change across many generations of populations of organisms. A favorite instance involves beavers. As ancestral castorids or ancestral beavers change their environments in ways that put into play the advantages of aquatic lifestyles, traits furthering that lifestyle were selected, broad tails for swimming, for example. These traits in turn enabled the beavers to remake more effectively their surroundings into aquatic ones. 
So the feedback cycle of niche construction was completed. Lineages of organisms changed the environment. The changed environment changed the organisms. The reasons theorists have worked at this coarse grain level are partly conceptual and partly pragmatic. On the conceptual level, it has seemed that measuring or modeling evolutionary change has needed long time spans and whole populations. On a pragmatic level, niche constructionists rely on the old trusty tools of population geneticists to model the probability of changes in traits and genomes across many generations. Taking in too many moving parts, too many traits or alleles, or too many ways in which a niche might be changed, renders the mathematics impossibly multidimensional. Only a model of niche organism interactions vastly simplified in relation to reality can be quantitatively described. But we can see qualitatively that there is no lower limit to the time scale on which niche construction operates, at least until we reach the quickest intracellular molecular interactions and the quickest times it takes them to express themselves in an organism's surroundings. Here's another instance of niche construction. The earliest photosynthetic cyanobacteria arose more than 2 billion years ago in an atmosphere with no free oxygen. Their metabolic release of oxygen eventually brought the composition of the Earth's atmosphere close to the one that sustains most life today. This so-called great oxygenation event is an instance of worldwide environmental change brought about by microbes constructing their niches. It was immensely gradual, requiring a billion years or more, more like 2 billion probably, but it led to a steeper and steeper selective gradient favoring the aerobic organisms that today dominate earthly life and pushing anaerobic organisms to fringe environments such as undersea vents. Now, it wouldn't be practical, practicable or revealing to model on a microbe by microbe basis, this niche construction and the change selection and the changed direction of selection that it brought about. A population-based view is clearly necessary, but by the same token, it would simply be wrong to say that any one photosynthesizing microbe made no contribution to the change. Each one releasing its oxygen molecules and altering its niche played its part. And in general, given the ubiquity of niche construction, we, not, we cannot find any organism niche interaction, however fleeting, that is not potentially implicated in the ongoing dynamics that come to manifest themselves in what we call natural selection. We are then beginning to radicalize niche construction, to follow it all the way down to the molecular transactions that come about in the organism niche relation. These transactions can have small and large consequences in determining whether the genome of an organism contributes to an ongoing lineage or how the genetic makeup of its population as a whole changes across time which is to say that the plasticity of an organism in the face of its environment is no mere exercising of ontogenetic options pre-programmed in its genome. Plasticity instead marks another point along the continuum reaching from individual life processes to broad evolutionary processes. This realization carries us over from niche construction to another main agenda of extended evolutionary theory, developmental evolutionary biology or EvoDevo. Let's explore the implications of this for a moment before returning to the case of music. To say that all organisms show a plastic responsiveness to their surroundings is on one level merely to affirm that organisms are open thermodynamic systems, always rebalancing their far from equilibrium homeostasis in the face of a fluctuating environment. In recent years, however, biologists have dug deep into this plasticity, following its causal pathways all the way from the environment to the genome. They have illuminated the molecular regulatory networks that mediate between environment and genome, transducing environmental signals. And in the process, they've come to see how plasticity brings about moment to moment alterations of the genome in response to its surroundings. Now, this is of course not to say that the nucleotide sequence of an, of an organism's DNA is constantly altered in plastic interaction with its environment. Instead, it is the expression of the sequence that changes, incessantly adjusted by the regulatory systems inside the cell interacting with those external signals. The regulatory systems involved uh, involve not only stretches of the DNA molecule itself that control the expression of other stretches, but also an array of RNA transcription factors produced in shifting amounts and the many proteins that they in turn produce. All these ingredients link in loops of feedback 
resulting in up and down regulating of the things we call genes. Viewed another way, all these things effectively remake how a gene can be usefully thought of or defined. And here's the all important takeaway. Altogether, from proteins and other cell chemicals to transcription factors to the genome, regulatory systems respond in real time to signals from beyond the organism. The mediating systems of Evo Devo biology rendered genetic expression itself an aspect of niche construction. Radical niche construction spotlights the connection, uh, the connection to Evo Devo, taking account of its new understanding of organisms' genomic plasticity to model microscale changes in organism niche relations. The merger of these fields holds out the promise of an integrated conceptual framework, as Manfred Laubichler and Jürgen Renn recently put it, mapping the extended regulatory system reaching all the way from, the, from DNA to the niche or from the niche to DNA. Laubichler and Wren envision this continuum as vectors running in opposite directions, not only externalizing cell systems so as to alter environmental resources, but also internalizing environmental condition, conditions and reshaping genomic expression. An example of the quick dramatic changes that can result from the internalization comes from honeybees. Dozens of pheromones, chemicals circulating through the bee's niche, are crucial in the intricate regulation of a honeybee colony. They're produced by individual bees, of course, according to complex pathways involving genes, RNA transcription factors, the proteins these construct, and signals from the environment. But the pathways run in both directions, creating loops of feedback controls. The genetic instructions don't rule the show, but instead can be regulated by the transcription factors and proteins they produce. And these in turn can be regulated by the pheromones they help to produce. Brief exposure to an alarm pheromone alters factors inducing RNA transcription in the olfactory centers of an individual bee's brain. Within minutes, it initiates a chemical cascade that up and or down regulates the expression of hundreds of genes, shifting the overall interaction of the bee's genome with its niche. Such plastic Genomic expression enters into all aspects of honeybee lives and sociality. Similar cascades initiated by environmental input regulate, for example, the transformation of in hive worker bees to out of hive foragers, which is not a pre programmed plan in a worker's ontogeny, but instead finely attuned and responsive to niche conditions inside and outside the hive. As such cascades disseminate across regulatory systems, they alter honeybee niche relations, changing the dynamic of evolutionary process hive by hive. Unless we think, by the way, that such phenomena are more constrained and less volatile in organisms with more complex brains than honeybees, other examples of bidirectional regulatory networks and radical niche construction are beginning to be understood in vertebrates as well. Indicators of quickly induced altered gene expression have been found in songbirds responding to the singing of conspecifics. And in an example especially relevant to this conference, conference, recent research has detected altered gene expression in humans in the molecular pathways that lead to relaxation during recreational music making. In the broadest view, the impact of radical niche construction on evolutionary theory is to underscore basic questions that have arisen from other philosophical quarters in the last 25 years ago. Radical niche construction embraces the processual view of the history of life advocated by writers such as John Dupre and Daniel Nicholson. In this view, and I quote them, the right way to understand the living world at all levels is as a hierarchy of processes rather than of things. I quote them again, it is a mistake to suppose that processes require underlying things or substances. In this view, genomes, intracellular epigenetic systems, organs, organisms, superorganisms, co-evolved networks of different organisms, species, and niches all find their places in, this, in the, the network of hierarchies, but they are recognized as epistemological snapshots, stills taken from moving pictures. Now, the stills, of course, are often useful for our conceptualization of living processes, often, but not always. They are especially problematic in describing evolutionary process. Targets of natural selection, or the, advant the advantageous functions that bring about the targeting, or the selection for a function, or the discrete adaptations supposed to emerge, 
These reify moving, moving processes, giving a static form that doesn't really exist to the entities named. The reification results in a conundrum regarding evolutionary causality. The reified entities seem to suggest causal chains connecting them. A function causes natural selection to choose a target, which results, causes, results in an adaptation. But the causality cannot be followed in the voids between the reified entities. Radical niche construction resists this reification. It does not call into question the fundamental role of selection in evolution, and neither does it question the fact that organisms show features, characters, or traits that are adapted to their environments, though it insists on viewing these as fluid elements in historical processes on all levels, small and large, short and long. The radical view does not cast causality into the empty spaces between entities, but instead understands causality across the hierarchies of processes. The discreteness of those entities begins to dissolve into process, just as most of the basic terms of 20th century biology, genes, species, and even organisms have lost a good deal of their solidity, the solidity that was once assigned to them. It's this kind of causality that we need to understand to narrate the history of life we aim to tell. In place of discrete frozen adaptations connected by unreal causal chains then, radical niche construction proposes the analysis of ever finer granular levels of evolutionary process. It calls on us to dig deeper in attempting to describe the histories at stake. This describes its asymptotic challenge the requirement that our historical narratives always approach more closely the unreachable limit case of a full description of evolutionary process. The asymptotic challenge grows exponentially with the complexity of the trait in question. As we know, some traits can be usefully understood as controlled by a single gene or even differentially expressed because of a polymorphism in a single nucleotide. In such Mendelian cases, the asymptote of full description hovers close overhead, almost within reach. Perhaps in such cases, we can even tell stories of selection for a given function with some confidence. However, if we introduce even modest complexity in the controls by which a trait is manifested, at whatever systemic level these operate in hierarchies reaching from transcriptome to environment, or if we multiply the intricacy of a trait's relation with niche affordances, then the asymptote flies high away from us. Selection for becomes a vague, illusory concept even a conceptual cop-out. Functions become fuzzy and their clear demarcation oversimplifies and distorts. And any assertion that some aggregate of features is an adaptation loses its meaning. Move on now to the most complex traits. These include most of the features we think of as traits. For example, many plants intricate multi-component adjustments to more or less shade and other environmental fluctuations. They include the hugely varied reproductive cycles that organisms and superorganisms show, featured by Peter Godfrey Smith in his attempt to define Darwinian individuals that enter into natural selection. They include these most complex traits include the long conserved character identity networks and character identity mechanisms that Evo Devo biologists led by Gunther Wagner have used to understand deep homology among life forms and the canalization of certain developmental pathways. They include the complexes of capacity and behavior in the niche that mark countless social animals. For example, all those interactions of bees in a colony that maintain the homeostatic conditions of superorganism growth and reproduction. And the most complex traits certainly include the behaviors and capacities biocultural evolutionists think of as defining cultural animals. Examples of these include vocal learning and thousands of species of songbirds, parrots, and hummingbirds or many animals learned technologies, or humans' language capacities, or in a particularly vexed case that has given rise to much racist nonsense in popular scientific writings, human intelligence. It's possible, indeed, perhaps even useful in certain well-defined circumstances to lump each of these complex assemblages of capacities and behaviors together. I'm not sure about intelligence, by the way, but many of the others. Conceiving of the aggregate then as a discrete trait, vocal learning, for example, as a trait of songbird species. Though real dangers are uh, dangers of distortion and oversimplification lurk here in this clumping. But converting such assemblages into adaptations, that is targets of selection, is meaningless. 
It's time for us to stop asserting things like birdsong was selected for the advantage it confers in finding a mate or defending a territory. Every time we do so, we so simplify evolutionary process as to open it to charges of speciousness, vacuity, or worse. Darwin deserves better from us, I think. Finally, I return to music. It's in an important review of 2017, Dylan van der Schiff and Andrea Schiavio, one of the organizers of this conference, set out to join an incremental biocultural view of music's emergence with a fully embodied view of music cognition. The cognitive model they offered, rooted in James Gibson's environmental psychology, but much developed across the decades since by Francisco Varela, Eric Clark, and many others, sees cognition as embedded in an organism's surroundings, enacted through the body as a transaction with those surroundings, and thus extended out into them, those surroundings. Meanwhile, for their biocultural view of music's origins, van der Schiff and Schiavio borrowed my own model from the 2015 uh, book I mentioned before, A Million Years of Music. The essential achievement of their review lay not in the novelty of either of its main components then, evolutionary musicology on the one hand, embodied cognition. Instead, their achievement, their important achievement, was the marking of a new stage in the merging of these endeavors. The review described an integrated conceptual framework in which a musical continuum might be glimpsed, extending from individual acts of embodied music, embodied music cognition all the way to the evolutionary emergence of musical capacities. This is an important step forward, it seems to me. Its insistence on a biocultural approach in the first place is essential. Our stories of music's emergence need to be lodged at the meeting place of biology and culture always. They need indeed to stop trying to separate biology and culture. They need to narrate the emergence of new modes of inactive cognition and, and theorize the complex evolution of cultural practice and biologic, biological substrate the complex co-evolution, I meant to say, of cultural practice and biological substrate. To achieve this, we will need, I believe, to take on something like the epicyclic model of biocultural evolution I offered, summed up by van der Schiff and Schiavio. In this model, cultural systems of increasing complexity are seen to create regulatory mechanisms that can stand outside the feedback loops of biocultural niche construction, controlling or channeling or canalizing their ongoing processes. The explosion of complex systematization of culture in the late history of the hominin line, beginning as early as half a million years ago, is in my view largely due to the accrual of such epicycles around the general cycles of biocultural niche construction. The role of embodied cognition in van der Schiff and Schiavio's account also veers close to the radical niche construction I've sketched here. All approaches to cognition that extend it beyond the brain, through the body, and into enactments in the organism's environment all such approaches are niche constructive approaches. Individual cognitive acts enmesh the cognizing organism with its environment, altering it insofar as they manifest themselves in responses to affordances and altering the ongoing cognitive experience and potential of the individual as its relation to affordances shifts. Cognition internalizes the conditions of the niche even as it externalizes the cell and organ systems from which it arises. Van der Schiff and Schiavio's integrated view, in other words, is comprehensive enough to take in evolutionary process, but granular enough to suggest how we might connect such process to momentary changes in an organism's cognitive stance. So what, in the light of, of this view, are some of the directions a granular story of music's emergence might follow? To conclude, I want to offer a, a few possibilities. The question of cognitive entrainment is the first of them. An early human processing rhythmic periodicity from some stimulus and moving in synchrony with peers, likewise processing it, was altering its niche through actions that entered into a social and cultural commons. An even earlier human, unable to follow the enacted rhythmic regularities of an older peer, sorry, an even earlier human, able to follow the enacted uh, rhythmic regularities of an older peer chipping stones to make tools, was altering its niche in likewise complex sociocultural ways, as was even earlier, a third human chipping stones in a way that helped to shape its own cognitive regularities, later reinforced in more stone napping. In all three cases, cognition and niche are mutually reshaped. All three cases might figure in an evolutionary history of our finely tuned entrainment capacities, taking a role then in a granular story of the sort I've advocated here. 
The bodies of knowledge brought to bear in analyzing these instances would involve not only the most up-to-date psychological studies of entrainment, but much more. The latest modeling of neural mechanisms sponsoring entrainment by cognitivists, the most precise archeological knowledge we have of technologies among our distant ancestors, the inferences made by cognitive archeologists as to the capacities reflected in those technologies, and the radical niche construction theory I've described. Note that only in the latest of my three hypothetical scenes, a group and training to the, an external periodized stimulus, say a beaten drum, does anything like music begin to take shape. Here's a second direction involving musical semiosis. The fundamental mode of musical semiosis in the world today is the Persian indexicality I referred to earlier. It is this pointing capacity working at various hierarchic levels that makes possible the prediction that is a fundamental ingredient of musical experience and named in our conference's title, of course. But how did indexical signaling itself come to be focused in the hominin lineage? Indexicality is widespread among non-human animals in the world today. Archaeological inference suggests that its complexities burgeoned long ago in hominin history, reaching levels of systematization beyond the level of most non-human indexicality today, reaching indeed a point that I see as marking a whole stage of hominin cognitive evolution, what I've called a hyperindexical stage. What we can learn about music's what what can we learn about music's emergence from a joint study of Persian semiotic theory and cognitive archaeology? And let's add another ingredient to this mix. It seems clear to me that ethological study of non-human semiosis today might contribute to this effort. Study, for example, of the combinatorial indexicality of much bird song. Can such study help to illuminate fundamental wetware substrates involved in indexical semiosis? Can it help us construct cognitive models of semiotic process? And what can these and can these then be brought to bear on an evolutionary history of semiosis among hominins? Note, by the way, note that in invoking birdsong, I'm not espousing it as a kind of non-human music. The evidence against such a romantic assimilation of music to birds' music is strong. Instead, I'm suggesting that birdsong might illuminate more basic semiotic capacities, clarifying how these can function in complex sociality, even in the absence of symbolic semiosis an absence that was clearly the circumstance of our oldest hyperindexical ancestors. And here's one more ingredient that might be added to the study of the emergence of musical indexicality. Several of the most influential theories of ritual today emphasize the major role of ritual, emphasize the major role it reserves for indexicality, even in the midst of hyperdeveloped symbolism, the hyperdeveloped symbolism that's a major, uh, that is a defining feature of all modern human culture. Can a joint effort of ritual studies, semiotic analysis, and interpretative archaeology shed light on the ubiquitous connection of music and ritual? Here's a third direction for our cognitive biocultural investigations. We can posit a growing complexity of communicative strategies among our ancestors. I've called this, with linguist Jill Bowie, proto-discourse, and it was, in my view, intimately tied to the ancient achievement of hyperindexicality. From this proto-discourse, I've argued, proto-language and proto-music, and finally language and music, were gradually differentiated. Somewhere in this differentiation, timbral and pitch processing in proto-music and proto-language diverged. In proto-music, pitch cognition came to be digitalized, so to speak, around pitch clusters related to one another in their simple integer ratios. In proto-language, a fluid sliding analog intonational spectrum came to be prominent. Even in modern tonal languages, this difference is marked. In timbral processing, so closely linked to pitch processing, something like the reverse happened. In proto music, the sensitivity to a graded analog spectrum of timbres came to the fore. While in proto language, there, there emerged at least one function for timbre that was digitalized the demarcation of small clusters of vowel sounds distinguished by timbre, which remains, of course, a fundamental feature of natural language. Can music cognition and language cognition studies today help to illuminate this divergence in processing pathways? Can it help us to refine further a cognitive archaeology that sheds light on the emergence of both music and language from some earlier proto-discourse? Finally, and perhaps uh, most generally, the question of hierarchization. 
The cognizing that is involved in hierarchical perception and action is very ancient, as is revealed in the construction of complex composite tools well documented in both early sapiens and Neanderthals. Hierarchized cognition seems to be fundamental in most areas of music cognition, from perception of temporal periodicity to that of pitch clusters. What are the new neural net models cognitivists offer for hierarchic cognition? Can these be linked to enacted cognition in precise ways? Can a merger of such models with cognitive archaeologists' findings begin to delineate stages in the growing complexity of ancient humans' hierarchic cognition? So along paths such as these, we might further the granular account of music's emergence we need, relinquishing selection for music as a whole, and incorporating the new understandings of evolutionary process that have been achieved over the last decades. Will such paths lead us to an account that is granular enough? But what could such a question mean? By definition, the asymptote of complete description will always remain out of reach, the possession of Laplace's demon perhaps, but not of mortals. Sharper focus and deeper analysis is what we can hope for, perhaps with occasional revelations along the way. But then this has been true ever since Darwin converted life science into a resolutely historical endeavor. Thank you very much. Look forward to your questions.